Um, instead of focusing on my many heroic exploits <laughs> or highlighting some of the really neat people that I have worked with who have been victimized by the system, today I'm going to take a slightly different approach. But before I get started, I just want to touch on a few basic facts. Uh, because I come bearing bad news. As everybody in this room knows, since the early 1980s, the fundamental shape of the criminal justice system has changed. It's less and less about preventing and punishing crime, and more and more about managing and controlling the surplus population. Consider a few statistics. The Texas prison population soared from 39,000 people in 1988 to 151,000 10 years later. That's an increase of 387% in one decade. Look at a slightly bigger span from 1980 to 2004. The prison population in Texas increased sixfold. Spending on corrections during that period increased 1,600%. During that period, Texas spent seven times more on its correction system than it spent on its higher education system. In 1950, this is a real stunning fact. In 1950, if you were a young African American boy, chances were 3% that you would end up behind bars. By 1996, the chance was 29%. So we're in Chicago. How are things looking in the Windy City? About 90% of those sentenced to prison for a drug offense in Illinois are African American. The total population of black males in Chicago with a felony record, including both current and ex-felons, is equivalent to 55% of the adult male black population of the city. Between 1985 and 2005, the number of Chicago residents annually sent to prison for drug crimes has increased 2,000%. I got those statistics from Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in an Age of Colorblindness. It's for sale at the back. I urge you to get a copy. It's the best thing on the criminal justice system that's been published in years. And here's a quote. She says, Today the political fanfare and the vehement racialized rhetoric regarding crime and drugs are no longer necessary. Mass incarceration has become normalized. And all of the racial stereotypes and assumptions that give rise to the system are now embraced, or at least internalized, by people of all colors, from all walks of life, and in every major political party. We may wonder aloud, where have all the black folks gone? Where have all the black men gone? But deep down, we already know. It is simply taken for granted, she said, that in cities like Baltimore and Chicago, the vast majority of young black men are currently under the control of the criminal justice system or branded felons for life. Yeah. This extraordinary circumstance, unheard of in the rest of the world, is treated here in America as a basic fact of life as normal as separate water fountains were just a half century ago. Can't put it more forcefully than that. Has the situation for people of color improved since the Jim Crow era? If you look at Barack Obama in the White House, you're going to say, well, of course it has. And it all depends who we're talking about. Educated members of the African American middle class have seen vast improvements in opportunity status and in many cases family income. Unfortunately, African American families clinging to the lower rungs of the socioeconomic ladder have had a different story to tell. They've been devastated by years of mass unemployment, disappearing jobs, abysmal schools, and America's war on drugs. And once you have been convicted of a felony in America, you will never taste freedom again. Not, not real. No matter what you do or where you turn, you're always in the cage. 
Even if they give you probation, you are now branded as one of them. Just try to get a job when the unemployment rate in your neighborhood is 40%. And you're a convicted felon. And you got to check that box on the app. All right. You know the life of a street hustler is a one-way ticket to the joint. But what are your alternatives? The old Jim Crow was created to control people of color, period. The new Jim Crow is designed to control a surplus population that is disproportionately black and brown. Since the mid-1970s, America has struggled to ignore a dirty little secret. We don't have enough jobs for everybody. And we don't intend to have enough jobs for everybody. It's bad for business and creates inflation. You can blame outsourcing or deindustrialization or post-industrialization or neoliberal economics or any other kind of multisyllabic descriptor you want. It all comes out to the same thing. To understand how radically our society has changed, it is helpful to trace the life stories of the folks who are currently running the new Jim Crow in little southern towns. The stories you're about to hear are all taken from the work that I have done and people that I have focused on, but their name is Legion. They are symptoms <coughs> of the current reality across the country. I started using the phrase, the new Jim Crow, when I was moved, working in uh, Tulia, Texas, when I just realized that a drug bust that swept up half the adult males in the little town I was living in was pretty much standard operating procedure. The new Jim Crow, that seemed to be the only phrase that cut to the heart of it. There was a picture of Larry Stewart in an old copy of the Tulia Herald. It's 1960, and they're having cowboy days at the Tulia High School. And Larry's wearing a big star and a 10-gallon hat and calling himself sheriff for a day. But little Larry didn't intend to be a sheriff. Like his daddy and everybody he knew, he wanted to be a farmer. Got out of high school, went to Abilene for a year, Texas Christian University. That didn't seem to be relevant. There was money to make, he made in agriculture, so he came home and went to work on the farm. The 1960s were an incredibly productive time in the Texas panhandle. Farmers were pumping oceans of water out of the Ogallala Aquifer, and the panhandle was blooming like a proverbial rose. Three of the top ten agricultural counties in the United States were between Lubbock and Amarillo in the early 60s. I didn't realize that. It's amazing. Throughout the late 1950s and most of the 60s, the strong demand for field labor drew dispossessed black sharecroppers from East Texas, old Jim Crow territory, to little panhandle towns like Tulia. Folks didn't want them living in town, of course. That wouldn't do. So they got a bunch of abandoned old shacks from the hard old Depression era. And they got some old rusty railroad cars and they loaded them up on flatbed trucks and moved them to a two block square area on the west side of the tracks they called the Sunset Edition. People lived there without running water, without flush toilets or baths. And during the winter, children huddled around wood burning stoves or pulled stuff out of their mattresses to stuff into the chinks in the walls. But that side of life was largely invisible to people like Larry Stewart and the rest of the folks living across the tracks on the white side of Tulia. All the talk there was about the string of bootleg bars in Sunset. Swisher County was dry. 